Hello friends, this is Vision Overseas. We are providing both online and offline coaching with most repeated and authentic practice material. Once you join our coaching, you will be updated with latest practice material for next quarter. If you have any question or query, you can visit our website thevisionoverseas.com and even you can contact us on given WhatsApp number for more details. Thank you. Adult obesity is worsening, and more than 1 in 8 adults in the world is obese. The problem is most significant in North America, but Africa and Asia are also experiencing an upward trend, the report shows. Undernutrition and obesity coexist in many countries, and can even be seen side by side in the same household. Poor access to nutritious food due to its higher cost, the stress of living with food insecurity, and physiological adaptations to food deprivation help explain why food insecure families may have a higher risk of overweight and obesity. The BSc in Animal Health degree enables you to complete your pre veterinary requirements. Research areas include the biology and behavior of domestic animals, the relationship between humans and animals, and the safety and quality of feed supply. You will have the opportunity to apply your knowledge and skills through real projects, case studies and practical skills development. You'll work closely with agricultural animals and have many opportunities for industry interaction. The effect of scenery upon the mind of man has often been noticed and much has been written about it. Illustrations of this are generally drawn from the historic lands and from the ancient people of the East. The civilized races, such as the Greeks, Romans and other nations who formerly dwelt on the coast of the Mediterranean, are taken as examples. The Greeks are said to have owed their peculiar character and their taste for art to the varied and beautiful scenery which surrounded them. Their mythology and poetry are full of allusions to the scenes of nature. Mountains and springs, rivers and seas all come in as the background of the picture which represents their character and history. The same is true of the Romans, Egyptians, Phoenicians, Syrians, Hebrews, the ancient Trojans and Carthaginians. Each one of these nations seems to have been affected by the scenery. Those who make public parks are apt to attempt too much and to injure not only the beauty, but the practical value of their creations by loading them with unnecessary and costly details. From the time when landscape gardening was first practiced as a fine art to the present day, park makers have been ambitious to change the face of nature, to dig lakes where lakes did not exist and to fill up lakes where they did exist, to cut down natural hills and to raise artificial ones, to plant in one place and to clear in another, and generally to spend money in construction entirely out of proportion to the value of the results obtained. Baking as a business or profession has never been confined to the making of bread alone, that is to say, bread in everyday use. A baker we take to mean a person who bakes and prepares any starchy substance intended for human food. Therefore baking not only includes loaf bread baking, biscuit baking, fancy bread baking, but also pastry making and confectionery. Two of the most essential things in bread baking, in order to produce a full flavored, showy, and sweet loaf are good yeast and good flour. A good oven is also necessary. An oven which is either too hot or too cold will spoil what would otherwise be a good batch of bread, so great care should be used in order to have the oven of the proper heat. Pan bread, or bread baked in tins, need a greater heat than batch bread, as pan bread dough is of a lighter nature than batch bread dough, and consequently requires more heat to keep it up. There are so many different kinds, and each baker, as a rule, seems to fancy what he has been most used to. When a country is shipping more goods in the form of commodities than she is receiving, it is said that the balance of trade is favorable. The term balance of trade is apt to be misleading. 
It is a convenient phrase relating to commodity shipments alone as they appear on the record of outgoing and incoming ships, which are always subject to government inspection and from which a definite and accurate compilation can be made and is made. If such balance of trade runs against a country the actual balance of commodity indebtedness must be made up by shipments of gold, securities or transfer of credits. Outside of commodities which appear in making up the balance of trade there are a number of invisible factors, not of statistical public record, which go to determine the extent to which the citizens of one country may be indebted to those of another, and by which the international debts are actually settled. These elements are not absolutely available in the form of statistics and can be only roughly estimated. Taking the United States as an example, there are certain factors not tabulated by the Bureau of Statistics at Washington because their proportions are unknown to the officials. These are the elements which comprise the invisible factors in determining the settlement of international debts. The tomato belongs to the nightshade family, and for this reason was long looked upon with suspicion. It was first used for ornamental purposes and was called love apple. Gradually, as the idea of its poisonous nature became dispelled, it grew more and more popular as a food, until now in the United States it is one of the most common garden vegetables. It contains 7% of dry matter, 4% of which is sucrose, dextrose, and fructose. It also contains some malic acid, and a small amount of proteins, lycopene, cellulose, and beta-carotene. In the canning of tomatoes, if too much of the juice is excluded, a large part of the nutritive material is lost, as the sugars and albumins are all soluble and readily removed. If the seeds are objectionable, they may be removed by straining and the juice added to the fleshy portion. The product then has a higher nutritive value than if the juice had been discarded with the seeds. When we are sleeping naturally, it is not necessary to believe, as has often been supposed, that our senses are closed to external sensations. Our senses continue to be active. They act, it is true, with less precision, but in compensation they embrace a host of subjective impressions which pass unperceived when we are awake, for then we live in a world of perceptions common to all men, and which reappear in sleep, when we live only for ourselves. Thus our faculty of sense perception far from being narrow during sleep at all points, is on the contrary extended, at least in certain directions, in its field of operations. It is true that it often loses in energy, in tension, what it gains in extension. It brings to us only confused impressions. These impressions are the materials of our dreams. But they are only the materials, they do not suffice to produce them. Neither vocalization nor articulation are essentially human. Many of the lower animals, for example parrots, possess the power of articulate speech, and birds can be taught to pipe tunes. The essential difference between the articulate speech of the parrot and the human being is that the parrot merely imitates sounds, it does not employ these articulate sounds to express judgments, likewise there are imbecile human beings who, parrot-like, Repeat phrases which are meaningless. Articulate speech, even when employed by a primitive savage, always expresses a judgment. Even in the simple psychic process of recalling the name aroused by the sight of a common object in daily use, and in affixing the verbal sign to that object, a judgment is expressed. But that judgment is based upon innumerable experiences primarily acquired through our special senses whereby we have obtained a knowledge of the properties and uses of the object. This statement implies that the whole brain is consciously and unconsciously in action. The loss of soil by erosion occurs where runoff waters are not obstructed by forest growth. Silt, sand, and every other kind of soil are swept from their natural positions and robbed by the foaming waters as they surge down the steep slopes. The stream or river which is flooded by these rushing waters roars down its narrow channel, tearing loose and undermining the jutting banks. In some cases, it will break from its ordinary course to flood exposed fields and to carry away more soil. As the speed of the stream increases its power to steal soil and carry it off is increased. Engineers report that the carrying power of a stream is increased 64 times when its rate of flow is doubled. If the flow of a river is speeded up 10 times, 
This raging torrent will be able to carry one million times as much foreign material as it did when it was flowing at a normal rate of speed, causing inexpressible damage and destruction of life and property. Some scientists say the use of fire helped make us modern humans. It dramatically changed what and how we eat and may have even altered our anatomy. But University of Utah anthropologist Polly Wiesner thinks that fire was also important in shaping human social interactions and cultural traditions. Her conclusions are in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Wiesner evaluated day and night activities and conversations of Kalahari Bushmen from Botswana and Namibia. These communities still live by hunting and gathering, as most humans did over evolutionary history. During the day, nearly a third of the conversations dealt with economic issues such as hunting strategies and foraging plans. Another third covered complaints, criticisms, and gossip. But at night, around the fire, more than 80% of group conversations were storytelling, often about people living far away or in the spirit world. Wiesner says that humans are unique in that we create ties to others outside of our immediate group. Gathering at the fire expanded listeners' imaginations and allowed for the development of cognitive processes that made it possible to form those links to distant communities, which makes fire the precursor to Facebook. You probably take your depth perception for granted. It allows you to easily judge distances. Each eye sends a different signal to the brain, and the brain compares the two pictures. But even using just one eye, the world doesn't suddenly appear flat. So how can just one eye provide depth perception? A team at the University of Rochester recently published a possible answer to that question online in the journal Nature. It has to do with a small part of our brain called the middle temporal area. This region processes information both from visual cues and from the motion of our eyes. Researchers examined macaque monkeys watching virtual reality. Basically, the eye moves when something crosses the path of vision. This middle temporal area picks up the speed of the objects relative to these eye movements. Neurons in that brain region showed activity that signaled depth perception even in the absence of other cues. This new information may be useful for creating better virtual reality, and scientists also hope that it leads to better tools to assist children born with misaligned eyes. When you get caught in a downpour, you probably don't think about the size of the raindrops that assault you as you run for cover. But physicists do, and they've come to the conclusion that the drops that hit the ground, or your head, are the shattered remains of bigger drops that fell from the clouds. Raindrops come in a variety of sizes, even within the same storm. And scientists used to think that to get that kind of distribution, raindrops must crash into each other on the way down, breaking up into smaller droplets or coalescing into larger ones. Now a team of French scientists has produced high-speed footage of falling water droplets, and they find that drops of different dimensions don't require collision. They come from the fragmentation of individual isolated droplets. Their results appear online in the journal Nature Physics. The video evidence reveals that water droplets first flatten out as they fall, and as these plummeting pancakes get wider and thinner, they eventually capture air, forming what look like little plastic grocery bags floating in a breeze. When the bags get big enough, they pop and you're left wondering why you can never remember your umbrella. Plants can't choose where their seeds end up. Some float on the wind, others on the water. Many seeds hitch a ride on or inside animals. And the farther a seed gets from its parent, and any predators or disease the parent might have, the better its chance of survival. Or so the theory goes. Researchers studied that phenomenon in the South American chili pepper Capsicum chacoense, which relies on birds like flycatchers to spread its seed. To get realistic samples, researchers plucked chili seeds from the droppings of captive flycatchers. Then they scattered them near and far from wild chili bushes in Bolivia. Contrary to the prevailing theory, distant seeds fared no better than seeds directly beneath chili plants. But it turns out the trip through the birds gave seeds a different competitive edge. The passage stripped them of predator-attracting chemicals and pathogenic fungi, which quadrupled the seeds' survival rate compared to their undigested counterparts. The results appear in the journal Ecology Letters. So even though these chili seeds don't need to go the distance to survive, you might say that a seed in the bird is worth about four on the bush. In autumn, New England foliage turns vibrant shades of red, yellow, and orange, which brings in lots of green, as in the money spent by tourists who flock to the region to witness the explosion of color. Because of fall's economic implications, exactly when the leaf-peeping season will begin is thus a source of constant speculation. 
Scientists know that factors including frost, heat, rain, and drought all affect the timing, but the whole colorful picture is still difficult to accurately predict. Now scientists have picked apart satellite imagery from two New England forest ecosystems collected from 2001 to 2012 to try to get a better handle on exactly what factors influence the autumn leaves. The scientists looked at northeastern highlands and coastal zones. They incorporated available data on chills, frosts, and heat, and rain, drought, and flooding. In general, cold, wet, and extreme heat made leaves change color sooner, while moderate heat and low rainfall delayed the coloration. But the different ecosystems behave differently. Forests in the highlands reacted to frosts both in spring and in the fall, while the coast only responded to fall frosts. The coastal region's forests were also particularly sensitive to rain and flooding. Incorporating climate change predictions for the next century, the researchers propose that the highlands will change color later in the fall, while the coast may start to turn earlier. The study is in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. The researchers note that more data, such as for extreme weather events and flooding, need to be incorporated into future models, which could help New England states maximize fall's economic windfall. Mmm, chips. One of the most sublime of salty snacks. But have you ever wondered how they get that perfectly salty sheen on the outside? Salt is sprayed on the surface. Young Su Lee is a food engineer at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. And he says not all salty foods are created equal. There's spray-on surface salt. There's salty liquids, like canned soup. And there are salty solids, where the sodium's dissolved in a matrix-like structure. Think salamis and cheeses. But when we eat those salty solids, only a fraction of the salt gets released before we swallow meaning a lot of that salt has no effect on taste, but a big effect on our daily salt intake. Lee's investigating that salty solid conundrum for a company that wants to make cold cuts that taste the same but contain less salt. He couldn't tell me which one. Um, I mean, it's a fairly big U.S.-based food company. (laughs) To find a salty solution, he and his colleagues created blocks of whey protein with various proportions of fat, water, and salt. Then they squashed those tofu-like blocks underwater to measure how much sodium the blocks released. Turns out, the bigger and more numerous the pores within the block's protein structure, the more salt that was released. The study is in the Journal of Food Science. Lee didn't actually have taste testers sample different types of pore-filled blocks. That's next. But previous studies have shown that airier, fluffier breads do indeed taste saltier to testers. And there's one other trick this study uncovered. Solid foods release more of their embedded salt over time. So next time you're about to ask for the salt, why not just spend a little more time chewing instead? It's graduation season, and some scientists got to wondering whether the folks who shake hundreds of hands while passing out diplomas run the risk of coming away with a fistful of infectious microbes, such as Staphylococcus aureus. Good news. Turns out the risk of being passed a disease-causing bacterium while pressing the flesh is pretty remote. That's according to a study in the Journal of School Nursing. The researchers swabbed the palms of 14 school officials before and after graduation. They found that before the ceremony, and even after a slathering of sanitizer, hands were home to plenty of non-harmful bacteria. On the infectious scorecard, one dean brought Staph aureus to a commencement. Two others, at a different ceremony, walked away with it. And one of those samples came from a left hand which didn't participate in any of the meeting or greeting. So the math says that of more than 5,000 handshakes, just one may have passed along something less welcome than a sheepskin. So, if you're graduating this spring, feel free to shake hands. Well, you wonder if the last person who wore that robe had anything contagious. Breaking a mirror means seven years' bad luck, and so does spilling salt or meeting a black cat. We've all heard such silly-sounding superstitions. Of course, why anybody would believe that stepping on a crack could break your mother's back is a mystery. But according to an article in the Royal Society journal Biological Sciences, superstitious behaviors are a natural product of evolution. Imagine an animal living in an environment where, over the course of a day, he might hear some rustling in the leaves or maybe in the grass. Now, movements in the grass could signal a predator attack, whereas the breeze in the trees is probably just the wind. Still, the animal has a choice. He can ignore all this rustling and go about his business, or he can run and hide. The most logical response would be to hide only when he hears the grass move. But what if it's hard to tell whether the noise came from the grass or the trees? Well, I could have sworn that was the trees. Could be his final thought. 
so the animal learns to bolt at the sound of the breeze because it could foretell certain doom. That better safe than sorry attitude is essentially a superstition, one that that cautious critter will likely pass on to his young. Knock on wood. Global warming might seem like a botanical boon. After all, milder temperatures and more carbon dioxide and nitrogen should feed flora. But a 10-year study has found that any initial positive effect on plant growth from climate change may soon disappear. The report is in the journal Nature Climate Change. Researchers transplanted vegetation from four grassland ecosystems to lower, warmer elevations. They also modified the precipitation at the transplant sites based on altered rainfall estimates. For the first year, the plants did great, producing more biomass and churning out more oxygen for us. But their productivity went down for the rest of the decade. What happened? Warming did speed up the nitrogen cycle, which should have increased nitrogen's availability as plant fertilizer. But a lot of the nitrogen left the soil through runoff or uptake into the atmosphere. In addition, productive native plants began to lose out to species that thrive at higher temperatures but are less productive than the natives. Warmer temperatures may spur immediate growth, but in the long term, we can't expect plants to like it hot. Pain-relieving effects of drugs like ibuprofen are well known. But ibuprofen and its relatives, known as non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, may someday have another use, as antibiotics. Researchers tested three anti-inflammatory drugs, bromfenac, used in eye drops, and carprofen and vetoprofen, both for treating conditions like arthritis in dogs. The investigators found that all three drugs bind to something called the DNA clamp in bacteria. That clamp's essential to repairing and replicating DNA. By jamming it, the painkillers can actually kill live E. coli, in a test tube at least. The findings appear in the journal Chemistry and Biology. Study author Aaron Oakley of Australia's University of Wollongong says we still need clinical trials to tell if this trick holds true in humans. But this study is a first step. Yeah, I guess it alerts a lot of clinicians to the fact that some of the non steroidal anti-inflammatories that they're using may have this off-target effect. And it gives drug developers, like Oakley and his colleagues, a whole new way to attack antibiotic-resistant bacteria. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Steve Mursky. Got a minute? Here's an impassioned plea for gun control. Of nail guns, that is, because accidents involving nail guns have gone through the renovated roof. In 2005, almost 15,000 people were treated in U.S. emergency rooms for nail gun injuries. That's twice the number in 2001 and three times the injuries back in 1991, according to data released in the April 13th issue of Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report put out by the CDC. The rising popularity of do-it-yourselfing seems to be behind the unfortunate trend. Most injuries are punctuated wounds to the hands, followed by hits to the forearms, legs, and feet, 6% of the wounded wind up being hospitalized. Although better safety instruction would no doubt help, the report's authors suggest a systems approach to the problem. They'd like nail guns to be impossible to fire until the nose was depressed, which would presumably happen only when the gun was flush up against whatever needed nailing. By the way, 96% of the injured were males, which could mean that they're doing most of the work or that women read the instructions. The early Earth's oceans were home to a lot of interesting chemistry. Now scientists have found that amino acids thought to be present way back when could have been cooked into other compounds vital for life, an idea you should take with a grain of salt. Four billion years ago, the planet was probably covered by a salty ocean dotted with volcanic islands and short-lived continents. German researchers recently mimicked some of the chemistry taking place along the coasts of the volcanic islands. They created an approximation of primordial seawater, then they evaporated it to simulate what went on at those volcanic coasts. They baked the residue, creating salt crusts. At those high temperatures, amino acids interacted with metal ions in the salt crusts and were converted into other important biological molecules such as pyrroles, which are part of the structures of chlorophyll in plants and hemoglobin in animals. The scientists presented their findings September 17th at the European Planetary Science Conference in Potsdam. Over hundreds of thousands of years, these novel compounds could have built up along the volcanic coasts, creating materials for the first living cells, which were really worth their salt. One of the concerns about working with genetically modified crops has been that vegetation growing in agricultural fields might escape out into the world. Now, for the first time in the U.S., researchers report a large population of GM crops beyond the farm, 
Transgenic canola plants in North Dakota had received genes making them resistant to herbicides, such as the weed killer Roundup. Researchers collected and tested 406 canola plants along thousands of miles of state roads. They found 347 carrying at least one resistance gene. There were also indications that the inserted genes were being passed on to new generations, producing some plants in the wild with multiple transgenes. The findings were presented on August 6th at the annual meeting of the Ecological Society of America in Pittsburgh. The transgenic canola plants are not about to take over the world, but researchers are obviously curious about how these particular plants manage to make it in places like the edges of parking lots rather than pampered fields. Any answers they find will likely affect future biotechnology regulation. Want to know the route humans took when they first migrated from Africa into Europe? Seems that they might have marked the path. Not like Hansel and Gretel, who consciously left breadcrumbs, ancient humans ate as they trekked, and they appear to have chucked aside the packaging for some of their slimy sustenance. Snails. Conventional wisdom has been that humans initially traveled from Africa to the Near East, then up around the Mediterranean through Lebanon before heading into Europe some 40 to 50,000 years ago. But recently, some scientists have theorized that humans made it to Europe first and then headed east. Now there's more support for the old view that humans traveled through the Levant on the way to Europe in the form of the shells of edible marine snails. The study is in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Researchers evaluated shells from an archaeological site dated to the Upper Paleolithic in Lebanon. The shells were mostly intact, except the tapered pointy tip had been removed, most likely for easier access to the meat inside. The scientists calculated the age of the shells via a variety of methods, and they found that the snails dated back almost 46,000 years. The earliest evidence of modern human remains in Europe seems to be no more than 45,000 years old. The snail evidence thus adds weight to the hypothesis that ancient people passed through the Levant on their way to Europe, and not at a snail's pace either. Eastern Gray Tree Frog looks exactly like the closely related Cope's gray tree frog. The big difference between the two species is beneath the surface. The eastern has twice the number of chromosomes, as does the Cope's. Having more sets of chromosomes makes the cells of the eastern frog larger than the cells found in the Cope's, and those bigger cells makes the eastern's song just a little deeper. Now University of Missouri researcher Carl Gerhardt and his student Mitch Tucker have determined that the slight difference in the calls, here's the eastern again, And here's the copes, is how the females know which species males to buddy up with, the ones with the same chromosome number that they have. The work is in the Proceedings of the Royal Society B, Biological Sciences. Speciation is often caused by a geographic barrier that keeps populations from mating, but the tree frog situation may be a rare case in which chromosome duplication and its subsequent effects presented a reproductive barrier. As in humans, it comes down to whether he calls. (laughs) 